We're starting the study of First Peter. And what we, if you've been in the classes, that means that today I'm going to spend a fair amount of time on introduction issues. I don't think I'll take the whole class, but one never knows. Uh, and it's important. OK, I, I, I say that a lot because it's important what we're trying to do when we're studying letters. We're trying to track the thought of the writer because we want to see he's an inspired writer. He's writing in a particular circumstance and situation. We want to track his thought of what is the spirit saying through this inspired man in that circumstance and situation so we can hear correctly and then we'll be in a position to hear what the Spirit of God is saying to us through what he said to the initial audience. So that's what we try to do. And I think the background of that is, is important in understanding that. And some of it, I tell you, just in case you run across things in the world uh, where you're reading something and somebody says, oh, Peter didn't write Peter. Nobody thinks Peter wrote Peter, blah, blah. I say these things to tip you off and arm you for some of these kinds of things. OK, so that's part of it. But let's talk just briefly about the authorship the internal evidence of the authorship is clear. By internal evidence, you mean the evidence of Scripture itself. External is something outside of Scripture. But the internal evidence is clear that the author of First Peter is the Apostle Peter. He's identified expressly as the author of the letter in chapter 1, verse 1. And in chapter 5, verse 1, it says that he was a witness of Christ's sufferings, as you see in Luke chapter 22, so he's expressly identified as the author. He says he was a witness of Christ's sufferings. And then there's also some similarities of ideas and expressions between First Peter, what we see, how he says things, ideas there, the way he phrases things. You see similarities there and with the speeches of Peter that are recorded in the book of Acts. And I won't go through those, but I'll just mention that's another way that you see that confirmation internally in Scripture that the Apostle Peter is the author. And we also see in Second Peter chapter 3, verse 1, that refers to a prior letter, uh, almost certainly referring to First Peter. Okay, so even if you think that Second Peter is pseudonymous, meaning that somebody was writing it in Peter's name, I don't believe that. But there are many people who think that. But even if you do think that Second Peter is pseudonymous, OK, it still supports the authorship of, of First Peter as being uh, as being the Apostle Peter, because it reflects the, the author's view. Second Peter, whether it's Peter or not, it reflects his view that Peter was the writer of First Peter. All right. So we have this idea. The internal evidence is clear. The external evidence confirms that Peter's the author as early as Polycarp's letter to the Philippians which is a date on that that people vary because you've got a lot of you know, deductions and guesswork here. But between 108, A.D. 108 and A.D. 114, so in that window is generally when Polycarp's letter to the Philippians is dated. And there, First Peter is used as a source. And the fact that you have somebody like Polycarp using First Peter as a source, it indicates the early acceptance of First Peter as an authentic letter of Peter because it wouldn't be being cited as a source if it wasn't accepted as an authentic letter of Peter, then by the end of the second century, the beginning of the third century, uh, uh, the letters explicitly identified as Peter's letter. You have that by Clement of Alexandria, Tertullian. And then according to Eusebius, early uh, fourth century theologian and church historian, he says that the identification of first Peter is being written by Peter, that that wasn't disputed in any quarters of the early church. All right, so internal evidence says first Peter, Apostle Peter's writing it. External evidence says the Apostle Peter's writing it. But despite that, there are many scholars, perhaps a majority, who would say that Peter did not write first Peter. And the reason they say that is because the Greek of first Peter, they claim is too sophisticated to have been the Greek of a Palestinian fisherman for whom Greek would have been a second language. You see, so they're they're saying, listen, I, I just I, I can't buy that this Palestinian fisherman could write Greek this well. So you, you have a, a number of people, but it's by no means clear, see, that Peter couldn't have gained the required proficiency in Greek through his years of travel in, in, in the service of Christ. So that the first off, you say, well, it's not at all clear you're saying something out of Well, this Greek is is so uh, developed that it could not have been the Greek of a Palestinian fisherman who obtained Greek as his second language. But that's not by any means clear, because Peter had decades of travel and interaction with Greeks 
So you don't know, well, how proficient could he have gotten? And then there's a lady, Karen Jobes, who wrote a commentary in 2005 in the Baker Exegetical series. And she argues in detail that there are a lot of, of Hebraic elements that interfere with the Greek. So her conclusion is, is that from the Greek, what you can draw is that this wasn't this was the Greek of someone for whom it was a second language. Ah, well, that would fit perfectly. But even if you didn't have that solution to the problem, uh, it's certainly possible that Peter used what's called an amanuensis or a secretary. So if he sits here and says, you know, take a letter and the guy taking the letters, uh, you know, somebody more proficient than Peter in Greek. So that's not really an issue. Uh, I don't think, but still you have, despite the internal and the external testimony, you still have people you'll run into that. Uh, the Apostle Peter wrote the letter. Here's what D.A. Carson and Douglas Moo say. Carson and Moo, I've mentioned them a number of times. Uh, they're well-known, uh, respected New Testament scholars. They're of the evangelical stripe, which puts them close to us. Carson and Moo, he says, this is in their book, An Introduction to the New Testament. They say, the case against Petrine authorship is therefore not at all a strong one. We agree with I. Howard Marshall. Marshall is a New Testament scholar from England. He's written a commentary on First Peter, but a lot of other things. He's been called the dean of evangelical scholars. He says, we agree with I. Howard Marshall that if, ever, that if there ever was a weak case for pseudonymity, surely it is in respect to this letter. Only the issue of language stands in the way of authenticity, and this problem is far outweighed by the problem of thinking that a pseudonymous letter would have been written and accepted in the early church. In other words, it just seems uh, a high burden of proof to think somebody pretending to be Peter and saying these kinds of things like, yeah, you know, I was a witness of his sufferings and this kind of stuff, that he that that would be accepted as scripture. Uh, that's very, very, very unlikely. So. Uh, Authorship, Apostle Peter. All right, now the place of writing. In, in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 13, Peter sends greetings from she who is in Babylon, chosen with you. And this suggests that Peter's in, quote, Babylon when writing the letter. Now, the historical Babylon of the Old Testament, the Babylon in Mesopotamia, it was in ruins at this time, basically, and essentially deserted. There's no indication that Peter was ever in the Babylon of Mesopotamia, and there's no indication of any church being there at this time. So it seems very unlikely that he, he's there when he's writing it. Now, there was a very small Roman military colony in Egypt called Babylon, but there's no evidence of a Christian mission being there until much later. So most people, in fact, virtually all uh, scholars, are persuaded that Babylon, it's a metaphorical reference to the center of Gentile and thus God-opposing power. Okay, Babylon is a metaphorical reference to the center of Gentile power, and it's a reference that was drawn from Babylon's role in relation to Israel in the Old Testament. Okay, so Babylon, what does it refer to? Uh, most all people, all scholars think that it refers to Rome. That Babylon is a reference to Rome. Karen Jobes, in her commentary, she says there's virtually unanimous agreement among modern interpreters that the referent of Babylon is actually Rome. And it's interesting that you note that in uh, Mark was in Rome in Colossians in chapter Colossians chapter four verse ten. Paul's this is this is Paul's prison epistles. Paul is in Rome, say from sixty to sixty two, when he writes the prison epistles. And, and you have Mark is in Rome at that time, and then Mark is mentioned, he's mentioned again in, in Peter. So you have this idea of, of he's there, Mark is in Rome, and, and he's mentioned to Peter in 513. And Eusebius says, he says expressly that Papias, who lived from AD 60 to 130, Eusebius, the early 4th century church historian, theologian, he says that Papias said Peter wrote his first letter from Rome. Papias is an early guy, 60 to 130. He says that Peter wrote his first letter from Rome. So we have this Babylon reference, which is a metaphor for the center of Gentile power based on its use in the Old Testament. So you already think in Rome. You have Mark being there at the time, so you think, oh, there looks like another link to Rome. And then you have the testimony of Papias by way of Eusebius, who says, listen, Peter wrote his first letter from Rome. So most people are satisfied that, that Peter's writing this from Rome. And in light of that, she who is in Babylon, chosen with you, probably refers to the church in Rome. 
OK, R- refers to the church in Rome. Now, the date from those things we can you can do a little uh, educated guessing about what's the date of the letter. If Peter's writing from Rome, if that's right, what's the date of the letter? And there's a strong church tradition that both Peter and Paul, they were executed in Rome by Nero between, say, A.D. 64 and 66, sometime around then. There's a strong tradition that both Peter and Paul were executed there. For example, you see in Eusebius's The History of the, Ch- of the Church, you see him uh, dealing with that in Book 3, Sections 1 and 2, a lot. Now, Peter apparently wasn't in Rome in A.D. 57, around 57, when Paul wrote Romans. Otherwise, you'd expect Paul to have given a shout-out to Peter if he's in Rome and he's writing there. So you think, well, he's not there then. And it seems that he's not there during Paul's first Roman imprisonment from 60 to 62, roughly, maybe 61 to 63. You know, you can move these a little bit because there's there's educated guessing going on. But it seems he wasn't there in 57 when Paul writes the letter to the church in Rome. He wasn't there in 60 to 62. He seems he wasn't there because Paul writes the prison epistles, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians and Philemon. And he doesn't say anything about Peter being there. And when you look in the book of Acts, you see that when Luke talks about Paul's imprisonment, he says nothing about Peter being there. So it seems unlikely that Peter is there in in 57, unlikely that he's there in 60 to 62. And Paul is not there when Peter writes uh, first Peter. And you say that because because Peter doesn't mention Paul. And if Paul had been there, given that that Peter is writing to people who would have known of Paul, if not known him personally, it seems likely that he would have mentioned, because where he's writing in particular, as you'll see in a second, that he would have said something about Paul if Paul were there. All right, so how does this all shake out? Well, the most popular scenario for trying to put put these pieces together, the most popular scenario is that Peter arrived in Rome sometime after Paul's release from his first imprisonment, Let's say around A.D. 62. Remember when he has his mission to the east, at least as Paul's life is typically reconstructed. There is a first Roman imprisonment. He's then released. He goes. That's when he leaves Titus in Crete. And then he comes back. At some point, he's arrested again and he comes back to Rome. And that's when he's executed. He writes uh, he writes uh, Second Timothy and then he's executed. So the most common idea is that that Paul leaves prison around A.D. 62. Peter comes sometime after that, and he writes first Peter before Paul is arrested and comes back to Rome. So that would at least would would at least fit. Now, given that we have to leave time for Peter to write Second Peter before he's dead, okay? So we have we have Paul leaves in 62. Peter's in Rome. He writes first Peter. We have to leave time for him to write Second Peter. We're talking, you know, about uh, First Peter being maybe 62 or 63, right around in there, writing it from Rome. Now, it's possible that Peter wrote that Peter came to Rome. He's not there in 57 when Paul writes Romans. Paul comes to Rome in 60. So Peter could have been there between 57 and 60. That's a possibility. The reason most people steer away from that is that Eusebius implies that Peter came to Rome only near the end of his life. So the closer we put it near the end of his life, the, the better we can account for that. You could just say, well, Eusebius was mistaken. I mean, Eusebius isn't inspired. But, uh, but if, you, if you say, look, he, he does have access to a lot of history. And so 62, 63, uh, that at least fits. Now, Hebrews, if you remember, we study Hebrews. It most likely was written to the church in Rome in the mid-60s, perhaps a bit closer to the beginning of Nero's persecution. I don't know if you, you recall that. But uh, so it's written there, probably closer to Nero's persecution than first Peter, a time when maybe there were more persecution straws in the wind, because you see that all over Hebrews. It seems like they realize that something is, is about to happen. Now, if that's correct and you have first Peter written from Rome, say, A.D. 62 and 63, then we can speculate that Peter, for some reason, is called away or leaves Rome after writing that. Things kind of perk up and get hotter. The Hebrew writer hears that. He sends a letter to uh, the the church in Rome in light of the coming Neronian persecution. Peter returns to Rome, perhaps uh, because of that uh, percolating uh, forthcoming persecution. And then at some point, Paul returns and, you know, Peter writes uh, Second Peter. And at some point, Paul returns. He'll write Second Timothy. And then they're both executed under Nero.
All right, so that's the reconstruction. That's it. Now, the audience and the destination. If he's, he's in Rome, he's writing, where is he, who's he, to whom is he writing, and where are they? What kind of people are they, and where are they? Now, the, his intended audience is mainly Gentile Christians. Okay, mainly Gentile Christians. No doubt there are some Jewish uh, Christians who are part of the congregation. You say, well, why do you think they're mainly Gentile Christians? There are a number of statements in the letter that, that suggest pretty you know, strongly that these people to whom he's writing are Gentile Christians. Uh, ch- chapter 1, verse 18, the statement that they were redeemed from their empty way of life, handed down to them the life inherited from their ancestors. The statement in chapter 2, verse 10, that they once were not a people, but now are a people of God. The statement in chapter 4, verse 3, that they'd spent enough time participating in the desires of the Gentiles, having traveled in licentiousness, lust, instances of drunkenness, revelries, drinking parties, and detestable acts of idolatry. So you see very strongly this idea that the people were, they're Gentiles who have changed and been brought into the people of God. Now the, the agreement in Jerusalem that Paul would evangelize Gentiles and Peter would concentrate on Jews. You see that, for example, in Galatians chapter 2, 1 to 10. You're familiar with that, though, that, look, you know, Paul, he's going to be the apostle to the Gentiles. Peter's going to focus on Jews. Apparently, that wasn't intended to be exclusive or permanent. Okay, in other words, it's not some kind of airtight compartment or thing. As Carson and Moo point out in their, their introduction to the New Testament, it says, Paul continued to evangelize Jews in every city he visited, and 1 Corinthians chapter 1 implies that Peter had spent enough time in Corinth to attract a following among the mainly Gentile Christians there. So it's not like, you know, Peter would sit here and say, well, I'm absolutely going to have nothing to do with Gentiles. Paul would say, I'm absolutely going to have nothing to do with Jews. That's not how it worked. And so the fact that Peter is writing to predominantly Gentile Christians, we don't know all the circumstances that produce that. But it shouldn't say, oh, that can't be. Because he says, Peter, you know, Peter goes to Jews. It's not that airtight. Okay, so don't let that don't let that uh, trouble you. Now, the Gentile Christians to whom Peter's writing, they're located in five regions of Asia Minor. This region, Asia Minor, is now uh, what is uh, occupied or it's now the the territory of the nation of Turkey. Okay, and and you have these regions are Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia and Bithynia. You see these regions right here. Now, these probably refer to Roman political provinces. In other words, uh, political boundaries that are drawn. But some people think, no, that that it's really referring to smaller uh, ethnic areas, not technically the political boundaries, but the smaller ethnic areas. But I think it's probably referring here to these political provinces. And you see Bithynia and Pontus, in Peter's day, this this province was a single province, the province of Bithynia and Pontus, one province. But I think Peter probably refers to them uh, the way he does, because Pontus, if you had the letter being delivered, you see, from if it starts from the east, then you'll see that the way he has the emissary carrying the letter, he goes through each of these things in order. Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and then he winds up in the western part of that single province of Bithynian Pontus, which would be where the Bithynians originated or were at closer to that time. And so I think he just divides it up that way. Now, he probably, uh, at least quite possibly, doesn't go down and dip so far south here. He need not be addressing the Christians in the same localities as Paul's missionary activities. The way this is drawn it has him going down here to the same places that Paul had gone, but that's not necessarily the case. You see, he, he's the person carrying the letter. The, the emissaries loop through the provinces instead of going all the way down here. You see, he could have come down through here, cut over, gone more northern Galatia, northeast Asia, and come back up there. So he need not have gone in there in the same places. In fact, Carson and Moo, they say probably Peter has in mind only the northern part of Galatia and Cappadocia, and the northeastern part of Asia. Now, Peter's reference in one chapter one, verse 12, to those who have preached the gospel to you, that suggests that Peter didn't personally evangelize these Christians because he's those who preach the gospel to you. But that doesn't matter. They're brothers, right? Brothers and sisters. The fact he didn't personally evangelize and doesn't matter. OK, what's the occasion? Why is he writing to them? 
What's triggering his letter? The Christians to whom Peter writes, they're suffering some kind of persecution. I don't know if you've seen the thread. But when we looked at Hebrews, you look at many things. Being a Christian in this world is not easy. We live in a blip in, in the big picture where we have been the dominant kind of force, at least general belief in Christ. That hasn't been the case. That wasn't the case in the first century. That hasn't been the case most times in history. And I'm convinced is not going to be the case here before long. A lot of straws in the wind pointing that way, but I'll save that rant for another day. But he refers to their suffering. Why do you think they're, they're, they're suffering? There are a number of places. In chapter 1, verse 6, he says that, they, that now they have been grieved for a little while in various trials. In chapter 3, verses 13 to 17, he refers to the prospect of their suffering for righteousness and being reviled. In chapter 4, verses 12 to 19, he refers to the fiery ordeal among them. He speaks of their sharing in the sufferings of Christ. And he suggests they're suffering because they bear the name Christian. All right, so clearly there's something going on. Life is not all roses and everybody's not going, oh, you're a Christian, that's wonderful. That's great, I love that. No, you're a Christian, what's wrong with you? There's something wrong with you. All right, that's what, see, that's how we're getting. After a long time of being a Christian was something good, right, noble, our society is getting the point that Christian, that means that you're hate-filled, narrow-minded, judgmental, jumping on people. That's all you want to do. Yeah, 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 you're an enemy of society. Because you're running around talking about this sin stuff. I don't like you talking about that. I like doing that. So you're making me feel bad by saying what I'm doing is wrong. And it's a simple thing to turn that. In fact, there was just a, a Catholic professor at the... Uh, University in Indiana, who was just booted for stating his Catholic opposition to homosexuality. And they're trying to reinstate him now. But that's just these are just straws in the wind of where I I see this heading. Now, most scholars are convinced that the persecution that was being experienced by Peter's audience, this kind of persecution that they were experiencing was a local unofficial persecution. Okay. in other words, this isn't some decree that's going out from Rome as you had later. You had some just absolutely insane persecution of Christians empire wide. Okay, and I'm talking about going into, you know, 290, 303, that late. Right before Constantine. But you had this. But this is probably local unofficial persecution, the product of a general resentment of and hostility to Christians by the Roman public. The Roman people just didn't like these Christian folks. They were they were angry at them. They they resented them. Here's how Carson and Moo put it. By refusing to engage in the quasi religious customs surrounding the official Roman governmental structures. You know, they had all this kind of. Uh, religious air about things that were being done for the emperor and this kind of stuff, and they would leave that alone. By resolutely setting themselves against some of the immoral practices prevalent at the time. I'm telling you, people don't like somebody standing and saying, look, I don't care if you and everybody in the world says that's right. It's not. See, that makes people don't like that. And they want to silence that voice because I'm convinced deep down they understand the law of the heart that that's wrong and you're just reminding them of it and they hate it. Okay, they hate it. But he says, by resolutely setting themselves against some of the immoral practices prevalent at the time and by meeting so often on their own to celebrate the Lord's Supper, Christians were regarded with suspicion and hostility. The readers of First Peter were probably being criticized, mocked, discriminated against and perhaps even brought into court on trumped up charges. That's beginning to resonate or sound uh, familiar. It says this situation fully explains the references to suffering in first Peter, including 510, since Christians throughout the empire were indeed suffering the same kind of treatment. And in 414 and 16, since the readers were indeed suffering because they followed Christ and bore his name. So here, I, I, I hope that what, what we see in Peter, that it will be relevant uh, to this day and age, because as I say, uh, we're definitely moving in that direction. Now, Peter's writing to encourage them 
to endure in the face of difficulties. See, when it becomes hard to be a Christian, when there is a price attached to being a Christian, when it's not like, hey, this is like being in the Rotary Club and I have a lot of contacts so I can market stuff. OK, when there when there is difficulty involved, when being a Christian means something that there's pressure and hardship, well, it's easy for people to jettison their faith and say, well, look, this, you know, I didn't sign on for this. I thought this was kind of a, a neat social thing that I could, you know, meet people. The, 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 you understand that Christianity is just completely different. Does it have a social component? Of course it does. But is that what it is? Is that its essence? Its essence is God's redeeming work in the world. And we are kingdom participants. We are part of his revolution. You see, so it's a lot bigger than that. When pressure comes, people easily just and he's writing to them to say, listen, you need as you face struggles and difficulties, you need to hold firmly to the faith. Here's how Carson and Moo put it in a phrase. Peter calls on his readers to exhibit piety under pressure. As a means of glorifying God and of witnessing to a hostile but watchful world. Okay, this ought to be, uh, well, it's, it's relevant at all times, but now particularly so. All right, let's actually look at the letter. Okay, that's it. Well, look at the letter. First Peter, chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to the elect, sojourners of the dispersion of Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, Elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father in the sanctification of the Spirit with reference to obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. May grace and peace be multiplied to you. And let me say a little bit about the name Peter. OK, solve all your mysteries about Peter here, because it, it can be confusing if you don't uh, you know, pay a lot of attention and dig into some of this stuff. Let me say a little bit about his name. Now, Peter's given name at birth is an Aramaic name. The Aramaic name is Shimon, like you hear people still today in Hebrew, you know, Shimon Perez and this kind of thing. His name is Shimon. And then you, the way that's transliterated, you know, transliteration is where you simply take the word from another language and you try to duplicate it in your language, not translating it, just trying to bring it over like was done with the word baptize in English, Right. You got, you got uh, baptismos. Well, what, should we translate that? No, we'll just make it the word baptize. All right, so that you're trying to duplicate in the target language the way this thing sounds. So it's transliteration. So when you have Shimon, you can transliterate it into Greek in a couple of ways. Simon or Sumeon. And both of those were used. They're, well, they're transliterations of the Aramaic Shimon. And then when you get the Greek transliteration of Simon and Sumeon, they then transliterate into English as Simon and Simeon. Peter is referred to both ways in the New Testament. A couple of places he's referred to as Simeon. And then oftentimes he's referred to as Simon. Now, he also has a nickname. Right. Peter, Peter is given a nickname by the Lord to symbolize his new role as an apostle. You see that in John chapter one, verse forty two. Now, this nickname, probably given to him in Aramaic, which is the language that the Lord typically spoke in, and that would be Kepha in Aramaic. Okay, well, that, that then transliterates into Greek. Kepha in Aramaic transliterates as Kephas into Greek, which then transliterates into English as Cephas. And you see Peter is sometimes referred to as Cephas. Now, you have Kepha, which means rock. Well, if you translate rock into Greek, the Greek word for rock is Petra. But that's a noun that has it. You know, nouns in Greek have uh, they have gender. So they're going to be masculine, neuter or feminine. Well, Petra happens to be a feminine noun. So when you apply that to a man as a nickname, it becomes Petros. So Greek Petros is a Greek translation of Kepha, which is rock. So the nickname Petros then transliterates into English as Peter. So it makes sense. So you see, right? So you have you have Simon, Simeon, Cephas, Peter. Sometimes people go, wait a minute, you're just making this stuff up. This can't be the same guy. No, it is the same guy. 
It's the same guy, and it's the same guy quite rationally. This is how it is. Now, he's usually just called Peter. Sometimes Simon and Peter are combined, so he becomes Simon Peter. Okay, so you get you get both his given name uh, as transliterated and you get his nickname. Okay, so sometimes also it's at least one place, Second Peter 1, 1, it's Simeon Peter. But anyway, uh, that may have been uh, more than you cared to know about that. But there you have it. All right. Now, Peter, Peter here identifies himself as an apostle of Jesus Christ. So he's writing to them with the authority that's inherent in that position. And, you know, this to me is one thing, you know, when I think about society, cultures, this kind of stuff, one of the things, see, that I think is difficult in our society is to get people to see and to embrace the authority of the word of God. That, to me, is the bottom line in a lot of stuff. And a lot of it is people don't want to embrace the authority of the word of God because they think, listen, I'm into being God and into being king and living my life and doing the things I want to do. Now, if I say, as I told you before, I had uh, guys who uh, years ago in another life when I was doing working somewhere else, I'd be begging these guys to uh, listen. Why don't you read the Gospel of John? And they'd be, you know, I don't have time to read that. And they're reading Shogun. This book's just fat. I'm saying, wait, I'm holding up the Gospel of John saying, read this. No, no, I can't read this. One of the guys came down and told me and came to my office and said, uh, you know, reading that book's different than reading other things because that book calls you for a decision. You see, and that's what it is. See, and so you can't. Ultimately, there's a bottom line. Somebody's either going to they're going to bend the knee or not. OK, they're going to bend the knee or not. And sometimes societies and cultures are resistant to bending the knee. And they say, listen, are you kidding me with all this stuff going around here? Uh, I don't want to listen to that. Okay, we just keep pitching and keep preaching the truth. Uh, that's how we do that. All right, now he's writing, he, he, he's, he's, the word that he's bringing to them is a word of the Lord when he says, look, an apostle of Jesus Christ. He is speaking, the Spirit is speaking through him, so you and I sit here, we read this letter, God is speaking. Okay, he's speaking as we hear, what is Peter saying to his original audience? We hear what is God saying to us. And we have to study the Bible and get after it that way. Now, he's writing to the elect, those chosen, I put, I put this up before, the elect, those chosen for the blessings of God, whom he further, the elect are those who are chosen for the blessings of God, and he refers to them as, as sojourners of the dispersion, which is literally diaspora. Okay, the sojourners of the dispersion of Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. Now, this term dispersion, which is an odd kind of thing for us, but it referred to Jews who were living outside their homeland of Palestine. That's what it meant. The dispersion, the diaspora, were those Jews who were scattered, like scattered seed. They were scattered out away from their homeland. And so it serves as a metaphor for the people of God living in a state of dislocation. You see, they were out away from their homeland. They were living in a state of dislocation. It then becomes a metaphor for the people of God living in a state of dislocation. Christians are sojourners. Not a common word we use, but I kept the word because it carries this idea that we live in this world as resident aliens. We are present here, but our home is elsewhere. You see, we're in this state of dislocation. This fallen world is not our home. We are citizens of heaven. We have our vision and everything put somewhere else. And so he opens and tells them that. Now, they're physically located in various Roman provinces that I'd mentioned. And their election is said to be. Now, there are three different prepositions here. And I tried to, you know, not all uh, translations do this. I tried to distinguish between them and wrestled a long time with this, trying to make sense of in what sense is God's election consistent with these prepositions that he's using? And so what you're getting here, as you always get when I teach, you get my idea. <laughs> okay? This is what I think. But he sits here and he says that, that their election is according to the foreknowledge of God, the Father, in the sanctification of the Spirit, and with reference to, is how I took ace, with reference to obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. Now, when he says election is, in, is according to, to the foreknowledge of God the Father. Okay, Calvinists would disagree with me on this, but I'm not a Calvinist. <laughs> you see, they would disagree with me on this, right? That, that 
that uh, I'm persuaded that God's election, when he says elect according to the foreknowledge, his election is based on his knowing in advance that they would freely choose to put their faith in Christ. You see, God has that power that even with a libertarian free will, I mention that because there's a there's another kind. Calvinists say, I believe in free will, but I believe in what's called a compatibilist free will. When you get down to it, it seems to me that's not really free will. Okay, but it gets it gets complicated. But anyway, talking about all this, God, they're elect. How are they elect? God, in his foreknowledge, sees that they will be in Christ based on their free will choice to put faith in him rather than. See, rather than their election being something that's unconditional, that's based on nothing but God's choice. Okay, I mean, in other words, he doesn't conditional because they're going to be faithful. I foresee them being faithful. God just chooses individuals unconditionally. And then following that choice, he determines who will and who will not put their faith in him. Okay, do you see the difference? One is a foreknowledge of they will freely put their faith in him. God sees that in advance, so they are elect from eternity because God knows that. The other is God has chosen unconditionally. Those he chose unconditionally, he then brings them to faith. And the others he didn't choose, he doesn't bring to faith and will not. And they are damned. Okay, that's 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 a So I just say this when he says elect according to. According to the foreknowledge of God, that's what I believe he's talking about in the sanctification of the spirit. Election is in the sanctification of the spirit. And those who come to faith are sanctified by the spirit. Well, in what sense? Those who come to faith, they receive the spirit and thereby are set apart and marked specially for God's purpose. All Christians receive God's spirit. And so we are sanctified through that. We are set apart as those who have God's spirit within us. Compared to those who do not. Okay, so in the sanctification of the spirit and the election is with reference to how again, how I took that preposition, which is legitimate, but you don't see it in translations. He says with reference to obedience and sprinkling of the blood, it's with reference to that the blood of Christ and that it's tied to one's obedience to one's acceptance of the gospel message through which one is cleansed by the blood of Christ. You see this idea of accepting, being obedient to the gospel, when he says here, with reference to obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Christ, all of which is just introduction, praising God for his election, that they are elect, we are elect, we are the chosen of God. You see, and then he says, may grace and peace be multiplied to you, and he desires on their behalf grace and peace from God. Now, this is, you know, there's a form to ancient letters this is, a, this is common to this, but of course, the introductions and things are Christianized. As you see here, he says, may grace and peace be multiplied to you, of course, from God. Let me at least read this. The bell's going to ring here in a second, and then we'll pick up here next week, uh, Lord willing. Chapter 1, verse 3 through, 3 through 9. Praise be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who, according to his great mercy, has given us a new birth. Now, I underline these prepositions because he uses the same ones. Into, into, into. And I think it's easier for you to see what's going on here. He says, he has given us a new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Into an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, unfading, kept in heaven for you. Who through faith are protected by the power of God. Into the salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. In this time, you will greatly rejoice. Though now, if it is necessary, you've been grieved a little while in various trials in order that the genuineness of your faith, being more precious than gold, which though perishable is tested by fire, in order that the genuineness of your faith may be found to result in praise, glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ, whom not having seen you love, in whom not now seeing but believing you will greatly rejoice with an indescribable and glorious joy on receiving the end result of your faith, the salvation of your souls." Got a lot to talk about there. We'll pick that up next week. Thanks for coming.